Today I will be giving you a tutorial on the axial skeleton portion that includes the vertebral column and the ribs. We will begin our lesson of the axial skeleton by looking at the vertebral column. The vertebral column is composed of five unique sections. We have the first section here is known as our cervical vertebrae. It contains a total of seven bones. It's going to make up our neck. And just inferior to this, we have what's known as the thoracic vertebrae. And the thoracic vertebrae will also serve as an attachment site for each of the ribs. We have a total of 12 ribs, 12 thoracic vertebrae. And then inferior to that, we have what's known as our lumbar vertebrae, so just here. In the lumbar vertebrae, we have a total of five. This is also known as our lower backbone. It will definitely take on a lot of our weight bearing um, for the upper body. And then just inferior to these five lumbar, we then have our sacrum. So this is the posterior aspect of the sacrum, and if I turn it around, and this would be our anterior aspect of the sacrum. And the very last section of the vertebral column is the coccyx. It is a vestigial structure um, left over evolutionarily, which would have formed a tail within the primate classification. Um, it is reduced, it is shortened, and we essentially have no function for this at all. Another structure you may notice is this floating bone here, which is sitting anterior or in front of our third cervical vertebrae. This is going to sit on top of the Adam's apple in males. It essentially serves the function as anchoring our tongue to our throat. The primary function of the vertebral column, also known as the spine, uh, provides support for uh, the trunk of the body. Uh, it's where a lot of our muscles from our neck and our back are attached, um, as well as our ribs. The vertebral column is flexible. It allows for you to be able to move, bend over, twist, um, while still being strong enough to provide that support for your body. And one of the um, major contributors to that that allows for that is the uh, cartilage that exists in between. These discs in between each of the vertebrae are known as intervertebral discs, and they are made out of fibrocartilage. And as we learned in histology, fibrocartilage is capable of providing a lot of um, tensile support or um, weight-bearing support. However, probably one of the most important jobs of the vertebral column is to protect the spinal cord. As you can see by this image, I have up on the top is a picture of the brain outside of the skull, and then um, all of this yellow coming out um, are all of the nerves that extend from the spinal cord. And if I zoom in just a bit more, we'll be able to see how the, um, the spinal cord is passing through the vertebrae, and so the vertebrae will protect that very delicate and very important spinal cord for us. Now we're gonna take a look at the vertebrae in isolation. I've removed all of the nerves and the connective tissue. Uh, these are the vertebrae, and then these are the markings that we're going to be exploring. For the most part, they have a lot of similarities to them, and we will definitely point out some of the differences as well. Here I have isolated three of the vertebrae. I have the cervical, a sample of the cervical, and the thoracic, and down here the lumbar, and we'll compare those three. Uh, looking from the posterior aspect, we can see what we normally call the spine, but it's called the spinous process. And um, right away we notice something pretty unique about the cervical vertebrae in that it has what's known as a bifid or this sort of a forked um, component here. Uh, and you don't see that with the other uh, two cervical vertebrae. If we turn it laterally, your cervical vertebrae will sort of jut pretty much straight out, whereas the thoracic tends to have a little bit more of an angle pointed downward. 
And then with our lumbar, the sharpness of that spinous process, well, it's not that sharp, it's quite blunt in fact. So now if we look from the, the more superior aspect, we notice these processes that stick out on the side, they're called a transverse process. So this is the transverse process. We have what's known as these foramen, they're transverse foramen. So this is going to allow um, some blood vessels to pass between the brain and the rest of the body. And so that's something very, very unique, a major distinguishing feature for our cervical vertebrae, whereas the thoracic and the lumbar do not have the transverse process. So as we can see here in the thoracic vertebrae, um, this being the transverse process with the lumbar, the transverse process here, there is no foramen. Another component of the vertebrae um, are articulating processes that will allow the uh, each vertebrae to stack up and have a unique attachment site or articulation site. And this is known as the superior articular laterally we can see that we have the superior process and the, the next vertebrae will sit on top of that. We also have an inferior articular process as well for which the uh, this will stack up on top of the next. And we can compare them. So there are some slight variations depending on which particular vertebrae you look at. So we'll look at the others. And so this would be the superior articular process for our thoracic and cervical. And the inferior process for the cervical and the thoracic. Now, while we have the thoracic here, there's another unique feature about the thoracic vertebrae um, in that it has an attachment site for the ribs. So now remember that the thoracic hold the ribs. So there is an attachment site here and then here, and then the ribs will just sort of loop around anteriorly. The next component of the vertebrae that I would like to look at is known as the centrum or the body of the vertebrae. And so that's this piece right here, here, and here. And right away you notice uh, that the cervical is definitely a lot smaller. It's not as tall, it's not as thick. Um, and the thoracic is uh, somewhere in the middle and then the lumbar definitely much, much bigger, the lumbar. And it makes sense because the function of the centrum is to hold all of the weight of the body and essentially all of the upper body weight is supported by our very thick lumbar. The next component uh, I'd like to look at is the this, this hole here. This is known as the vertebral foramen. So this is where our spinal cord is going to pass through and you will see that in all of the vertebrae. So connecting the body or the centrum to the transverse process here, we have what's known as a pedicle, a pedicle. And so the pedicle is just the a bony um, tissue um, that will connect the body to the transverse. So the body to the transverse here body to the transverse. So that's called the pedicle. And then connecting the transverse to the spinous process is known as the lamina, the lamina. So here and here, here and here, here and here. And all of these bony components uh, form what's known as a vertebral arch here. So you've got that vertebral arch, vertebral arch. Now the last structures I want to talk about as far as the vertebrae are concerned are the two special cervical vertebrae that are responsible for holding up our skull. And so we have cervical vertebrae number one and cervical vertebrae number two here. Now if I zoom in, we can see that the occipital bone of the skull is resting on the cervical vertebrae one. Now, this one has a special name, the cervical vertebrae one, or C1, is also known as the atlas. So, um, the representing the Greek god that holds up our earth. Uh, and so, as you can see, it's sort of cradling our skull right here. 
Um, so on the superior articular process, um, we have that attachment site for the occipital condyle of our skull. Now, if we look at that articular process here, um, we notice it has a very rounded shape and the occipital condyle has, it reminds me almost like a, the bottom of a rocking chair. So this is going to allow our skull to rock back and forth on the atlas as if to say, yes, 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 we love anatomy. Now, if I remove the skull entirely and I'm just left with the atlas, now we're looking at the posterior side here, we can see that superior articular process here. And there's something else that's very unique here. It has this extra little piece here. It's known as the dens. And so what that's going to allow um, the atlas to do is rotate as if on an axle. And so this C2 has another special name. It's known as the axis. And so basically it's going to allow our head to rotate much like the earth on its axis as if to say no. Now if we separate them here, this will allow us to look at it a little bit better. Um, and so again, we can see the articular process there and how they attach. Um, but we notice something unique about uh, the C1, C2, or the atlas and at, uh, axis is that they don't have that body like we saw, or the centrum like we saw in the other vertebrae. Um, and uh, atlas does not have that very pronounced spinous process here, but they both still have the transverse foramen on the transverse process, as well as the lamina and the pedicle and that vertebral arch with the vertebral foramen in the center. The last of the vertebral column includes the sacrum and the coccyx here. I've brought back all of the remaining vertebrae uh, as well as some of the nervous tissue, so that way we can take a look at how all of this fits together. Now, as you can see, we have our nerves exiting through our spinal column, and it will actually exit in between the superior and inferior articular processes, right, those attachment sites. Um, in addition, uh, on the anterior aspect of our sacrum, we have what's known as a ventral sacral foramen, and that's going to allow the, uh, the nerves to leave anteriorly. It will provide innervation for any of our organs in the pelvic cavity, as well as our legs. And when I turn this around posteriorly, we also see that there is another set of foramen that will allow for the passage of nerves through the dorsal side. So this is known as the dorsal sacral foramen. Now, if I zoom in a bit more, we can see how that spinal cord branches into those nerves here. So just in here is a spinal cord right there, and these would be the nerves extending from there. And it will move down through this, what's called a sacral canal exiting through those foramen, and its final exit is what's known as the sacral hiatus. So that canal goes all the way through the sacrum. And then here we have the coccyx, again a procedural structure of approximately four fused bones. In addition to allowing the passage of this nervous tissue, the sacrum is also going to be the attachment site for our pelvic girdle um, or our coxal bones here. Uh, we have a total of 12 ribs, okay, um, and they're all attached, well most of them are attached, 1 through 10 are attached to um, costal cartilage here, okay. Um, numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7 all have a direct, their own passageway, their own costal cartilage directly to the sternum here, whereas um, 8, 9, and 10 over here, 8, 9, and 10, they all join together and then they meet up with the 7th one 
uh, on the costal cartilage to attach to the sternum here. So these are called the last three, so eight, nine, and 10 are called false ribs, and one through seven are called true ribs. Okay, and then we have these on the back, they're, they're actually seen better on the posterior side here. We have one, um, excuse me, 11 and 12, they make up our floating ribs here, our floating ribs, okay? All right, um, and all of the ribs articulate or attach to the thoracic vertebrae back here. The thoracic vertebrae and the rib have been removed so we can see their attachment site a little bit more closely. As we can see, the head of the rib articulates to that facet on the body or, or the centrum of our vertebrae, and the rib tubercle attaches to the other facet on the transverse process of the vertebrae. Okay, now I'm going to remove the costal cartilage so we can take a look at the ribs here. Okay, a little zoom in. We'll see that um, we have this flattened surface where it articulates with the costal cartilage, and our floating ribs will tend to taper on the end. Here we have our sternum. Our sternum is composed of three parts, three fused bones. The first part is known as the manubrium, and the second part, this mid piece here, our sternal body. And then we have our xiphoid process. There you go, so the three parts of our sternum.